you can think of me as the, the warm-up band for the real show tonight. And this is uh, uh, our special guest, Mike May, who, uh, in addition to having led a very interesting life uh, so far, is also a, um, a site recovery patient himself, who, as he'll describe, um, was, uh, was blinded at age three in a chemical accident. Um, but it turns out that it took about 40 years or so for ophthalmological techniques to come along to the point where his one cornea that was damaged, that was remaining, uh, could be replaced um, with a cadaver, uh, cadaver cornea and epithelial stem cells that keep it refreshed. And so it's one of the rare cases that happens in, in the development of ophthalmological techniques where people that have been blind for most of their lives have had their vision corrected. It's like those movies where they take off the bandages. What can they see? Um, we're very lucky to have Mike tonight uh, for an interesting reason. When we were first organizing this lecture, um, Mike was living in Davis where he had for how many years have he lived in Davis? 20 years? Yeah. Um, and so Mike is, uh, has worked as a subject in many of, of Ioni's experiments. We've put him, he spent many hours in a functional MRI scanner. And we've always had to fly him up for these experiments or fly him down to San Diego when we were down there. Um, what's interesting is between the time we were organizing this lecture series and today, Mike was interviewing and then did actually get selected for the job to be CEO and, uh, and president of the Lighthouse Foundation for the Blind, which happens to be based here in Seattle. It's one of the oldest blind um, 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 research or actually facilities in the country. What they, well, Mike will probably talk a little bit about that, but what they main do is, is try to work on employment and functionality for, for the blind community. And so Mike is here in Seattle um, on his third day of work today. He started on Monday. Um, <laughs> and it's just such a pleasure having him living up here with us. And so um, Mike will talk more. He doesn't need more introduction because much of his talk will be about who Mike is. Um, but uh, I'd like to welcome Mike not just to the stage, but to Seattle overall. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. To follow uh, your analogy about the, the band and um, I would have to say that uh, Ioni was my agent <laughs> because in um, you know, 15, 17 years ago, uh, she called me up and said, is, is what I saw in the news really true? And I said, yeah, what's the big deal? She said, it's a big deal. She sent some uh, email to one of her colleagues that said, I found this guy that's got vision like a cat. Uh, I'm not sure I was supposed to be copied on it, but uh, I saw that and sort of got a sense of her humor from that point and have been in that uh, fMRI many times. My view of Seattle is a very dark one from inside of a tube. <laughs> uh, so now that I'm, I'm living here, I'm, I think I'm going to learn a lot more about uh, some of the other aspects of Seattle. Uh, you might wonder, um, I have a seeing eye dog and I'm reading Braille. so. What am I talking about? Vision restoration. And that's what I'm going to discuss with you here for a little bit, because it's way more complicated than I ever dreamed it might be when Ioni first contacted me. And I've learned so much from her and Jeff and many others in the, in the community. I also want to thank um, Dr. Edwards for having something like this going on. It's really amazing to have this wonderful attendance and these subjects and 100,000 downloads. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So thanks to him and, and everyone who's put this on. Um, the two problems that face blind people categorically are reading and getting around. So reading has been addressed pretty significantly since I was in graduate school, where I had 11 readers. I used Braille, and I used tapes, cassette tapes. And today, doing those same classes, I think a blind person would probably have one reader and the rest of everything is done by reading things on the internet. Uh, things are available electronically. Not everything. There's lots of print materials that aren't available. And it, it's still a hassle. But there are alternative tools and techniques that mitigate how a blind person reads materials. Getting around is a little bit more complicated. GPS, which I started uh, making accessible in 1999, is now pretty ubiquitous. 
and it's the equivalent of, of a blind person's street sign because you want to know, well, what, what street am I on? What business is nearby? And that's what I've been working on up until coming up here to take over uh, the lighthouse. And I think that's made huge differences in blind people's access to the world around them. But you certainly find as a blind person that alternative tools and techniques are the ways you deal with the world. We all have different kinds of vision. So what I tell you about my vision is not going to be the same as other blind people in this room or any bl other blind people in the world. Everybody's different. Uh, my wife is blind, visually impaired, and sees quite differently than I do. Um, we also have things like optical character recognition, text-to-speech, that have made a big difference in how we consume material. We still can't get at things like handwriting, uh, graphics, LCD displays. Uh, this morning, going to work, I'm trying to learn a new kitchen, and this microwave started beeping after I pushed a lot of buttons to get it to go. <laughs> and it wouldn't stop beeping, no matter if I opened the door or anything. And I thought, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to come home from work, and it's still going to be beeping. <laughs> so I pushed buttons for about another five minutes, and it finally shut off. So I hope it's not going when I get back tonight. <laughs> um, obstacle detection is uh, really the purvey of the dog or a cane. And I'm a pretty good active user of both. And they, they have their benefits. The dog is really wonderful because they take you around things. But that has a slight downside of you don't know what you went around, you just know you avoided it. And it's kind of nice to know what's in your environment. With a cane, you feel your environment. You get to know what's there. That's a garbage can. That's a, a street lamp. Um, you, you, know, you learn these things. Sighted people have this notion that if they went blind tomorrow, this is something that you know, university students, when challenged with the idea of how could you help out blind people, they in immediately invent an alternative for the cane. And many of these have come to market over the years. None have been successful. But it's kind of understandable why a sighted person thinks, if I went blind tomorrow, I'd sure like a better way to get around than feeling my way through the world with a cane. Uh, so sonar, laser, radar, Doppler, it's all been used. And they're kind of interesting to augment the dog or the cane. But uh, they certainly don't replace it. They can augment it. We also find that with the cane, for example, when I feel something with the cane, there's a direct communication through that cane to my hand, to my brain. And if I have a tactile sensor, if I have a, a sonar device that's feeling something and it's, it's converting that to a vibration, it's just not the same thing as having the direct contact. It's a much different experience. So those kinds of nuances are really hard to communicate to sighted people who are excited about inventing some new technology for blind people. <clears throat> um, the GPS orientation is something that's made a huge difference in, in the way I perceive the world. But I'd say one of the most dramatic things that's happened for me and for blind people is rideshare. <laughs> Unbelievable. I got here by Uber. I don't know, I, I must have taken uh, 20 Ubers in the last uh, several days as I went out shopping for silverware and nightstands and all the rest of the stuff you need when you're, when you're equipping an apartment from scratch. And it's so uh, invigorating to be that independent. Their, their motto is um, everyone's private driver. And you might think that having a self-driving car is really the wave of the future, but I think the future is here because now you can have a, self, you can have a, drive, a car driven by a chauffeur. <laughs> and it's inexpensive, and it's sharing, it's part of the share economy. So it's, it's absolutely amazing to me, both Uber and Lyft and some of the other companies that are changing my life uh, and the way that we handle all the day-to-day -day problems of shuttling kids around in a family with two blind parents. Uh, I've been absolutely thrilled with of how that's worked out. <clears throat> it opens up a lot of opportunities. Being able to go to five business meetings in one day in Silicon Valley, not have to worry about parking, uh, it's, it's really one of the best alternative techniques that uh, I've experienced in my years of looking at a lot of different technologies. 
By the way, Johnny, you can, you can sit down now. She's brand new. I just got, uh, got her a couple weeks back from school. Yeah, good girl. So she's just two years old, but um, pretty amazingly mature for a new dog. Um, so one of the things that was presented me, to me in uh, 1999 was this idea that I could have an operation and get some vision. And it was just something that happened by you know, coincidence. I was in with my ex-wife getting her contacts checked, and, and her friend said, well, what's your story? And I told him, and he said, well, why don't you talk to the ophthalmologist here, Dan Goodman? And he talked to me, and he, he said, you know, we can do a scan. I can't tell by looking at your scarred eye, which was burned from the chemical explosion when I was three. He said, I can't tell by looking at it, but if we do a scan, uh, an ultrasound or a B scan, we can see what's inside and figure out if the eye is healthy enough or maybe we could have a stem cell transplant. And uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. And on the way home, you know, we teased around about all sorts of things. Well, what would it be like? You know, I first think, what would you do? And you got some vision back. Well, you know, I'd go to a topless beach in France. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife thought there ought to be other priorities. Uh, Ex-wife, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> But, um, you know, it was, it was a fun thing that I teased about with my friends and, oh, yeah, yeah. But later on that year, uh, I started thinking about it more seriously. And we put a date on the calendar around Thanksgiving. And I made this list of why to do it or not to do it. And it was a very long list why not to do it. The expense, the driving from Davis to San Francisco. I was starting a new company at the time. There was... There was really no reason, and what do I gain by having this operation? Life is good, I have a good income, I have a good family. Uh, what, what do I need vision for? And I also felt this idea of betraying my blindness identity. People think that if, if something's broken, you should fix it. Well, there's an unintended consequence from that. If you're encouraging a family member to fix something, that implies that it's broken. You don't really want to imply that there's something broken about your family member. That, you know, you're, you're thinking the best for them, but in fact, it's psychologically a very damaging thing, as I found out in researching some of the people who'd had sight restoration over the years. And so I, these are all the reasons why not to have it. It was a very short list of reasons to try it out, and the number one thing was curiosity. And I thought, you know, I, I really, I need to know what this would be like if I did have vision, and the downside is not that great. I could lose some light perception, but I could gain a lot of interesting things. So I have a video that we're gonna play now that will give you about 10 minutes of the, the Mike May story, and. We'll speed this all up so that we can get to talking about why I need the dog in the Braille and what happened when I had the operation. So we'll, we'll roll that and then um, come back and talk some more. My story is really not about overcoming blindness. It's about exploring life. I would really like everybody to look within themselves and identify what they're really good at, what they've accomplished, and also what their challenges are. Then set the bar at overcoming some of those challenges higher than maybe they thought were possible. And then raise that bar a little bit more and then go for it. crashing through. <clears throat> we came up with a, a book offer, book and movie offer, after some of this stuff happened. Um, I did, wasn't thinking that crashing through is the most elegant name for the book. <clears throat> <laughs> but Random House gets to decide that, not the book author. It's written by Robert Curson, and that story was told in the crashing through 
which made it to the bestseller list and was in the top 50 books on Amazon for 2007. So he's a really good storyteller. One of the things you've learned about in reading that book and <clears throat> talking to Ioni and others is that um, getting your vision back, uh, it's not likely to be perfect. So this is one of the things you have to look at going forward. It's fine to have all of these technologies that might give one vision, but how much vision? I mean, I certainly thought beforehand that I'd be able to potentially drive or read a book visually. No, I was far from that. So from one perspective, a little bit of vision is better than no vision, but at what cost? And then the expectation about being able to do functional things different, like driving and reading, that's, that's a big deal. That, that, uh, that incremental change is, is really quite significant. And so is one disappointed when you don't achieve those expectations? And that's what happened to some of these other cases. Uh, a blind guy, SB, back in the 60s that ended up uh, a couple years after he got some vision back, similar circumstances, he died. Uh, he lost his job. He just, you know, things just got very depressing and miserable for him. Other people have committed suicide. And when people told me this when I was going to have the operation, I thought, oh, come on. That's really being dramatic. Who's going to kill themselves over having vision? That seems like the ultimate. It's, it's biblical. Well, it's, it's a big deal. It's very, very overwhelming for the brain. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my vision. Um, I have a very strange hybrid. And when somebody asks me when I'm you know, in an airport or something like that, and the flight attendant says, do you have any vision? You know, it takes me 45 minutes to explain them to them, like <laughs> I am to you. Um, but in, really, in short, I'll just say I'm blind. Let, you know, leave it at that. And I still self-identify as blind. I use Braille. I use blindness techniques. But the, the bigger story is really I use an integrated combination of vision, so both low vision and no vision techniques. So in a nutshell, what I can see is colors really well, nearly as good as a, a sighted person. In, in fact, when uh, they did tests on me in San Diego with my, my color vision, my, my color vision was better than, than uh, Don's, who, who is testing me. Uh, so it was really good, and it was amazing. How could that happen? You lose your sight at age three. You come back at age 46, and you can say, that's red, that's yellow, that's green. It was amazing. Uh, I mean, I didn't get it, and uh, certainly there's been a lot of, you know, why did that happen? Somehow that remained intact and didn't atrophy over time. I certainly didn't know the names of colors like aubergine and eggplant. But the basic colors I knew and could see, and they were, they were wonderful for entertainment, just to, for landmarks, for all sorts of things. Uh, I was also very good at motion. It was amazing to go into the backyard with my kids, stand on a green lawn, and have them throw a soccer ball to me or kick a ball to me, and I could run and catch it in the air. I mean, it could be you know this far away, and I could run over and leap up and grab it. Now, when you've been totally blind and you're into sports all your life, something like that is really amazing. And I never thought of it ahead of time. I was just thinking of that beach in France. <laughs> this was really more significant, more life-changing to me than this other stuff. I was really poor at recognizing faces and a depth perception. Um, and the recognizing faces was frustrating because it seemed like, oh, I, I, I should be able to learn that. And I like to think if I set my mind to something, I can figure it out. And so after a couple of months, I'm not figuring it out. More months, it's still the same. I've got two blonde boys, roughly the same size, and I can't tell my own kids apart. And so that was, that was really mystifying. And, and I only you know, shed some light on that. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about learning about vision sciences. There's, it's just, you know, when your car doesn't work, if you know why it doesn't work, it's a lot better than if somebody just says, well, I don't know why it doesn't work, but let's try this. No, let's try that. 
which is often what happens. Somebody gives you a, a nice detailed explanation of what's going on and uh, it takes a lot of the, the stress out of it. Um, something like the edge of this stage, for example. How does that fit into my, my weird vision situation? So no dog or anything else, you know, I can just walk right up and stop at the edge of this stage. Now why is that? Couple reasons. Number one is I practiced that before I came out here and did it. <laughs> and I really like to picture the look on people's faces. They're going, oh, he's going to fall off. <laughs> so it's perverse satisfaction. Uh, in this case, you know, the lighting is kind of strange, and I discovered there's a little different color along the edge, but it's not super high contrast, a little bit. Now, there's pretty high contrast with the ground, but by the time I get to that, it's too late. <laughs> so, um, you know, this has all been the fascinating part of learning how to deal with blindness and, and low vision put together. And after a couple of years of overwhelming input and, and see, do I just close my eyes or how do I shut off all this information, I learned, let me do both. Let me integrate blindness and this really fits in with what I said earlier about alternative tools and techniques. Let's combine the benefits that we have. Let's use the things that help with our weaknesses and just fill in the gaps and kind of create a mosaic of, of what works for me. And I started learning, yeah, that what works for me, for example, in skiing that I was so good at totally blind, when I started skiing with vision, I was totally screwed up. Um, it was because Things are happening at high speed, and I would see a dark thing on the slope. I'm coming up on it, and what are you going to do? If you see something you think you're going to run into it, you, you tense up and you fall, you, know, you fall down. You're going to crash before you run into it. Well, that dark thing could actually be a shadow. It's just a chairlift going overhead, but that shadow to me looks the same as a tree or a person. Uh, big difference in what they really are. So I had to learn, Mike, don't pay attention to that stuff. Use your ears, kind of detune your eye, visual input. Look at the back of that guide with their orange bib and ignore this other stuff around you. Don't get distracted. That was hard to do, a lot easier said than done, but I realized that it was really helpful and so over time I got better at dealing with uh, integrating these tex techniques. Same thing with depth perception. I realized one time when I was in Montana, it was minus nine and we were skiing, and I just said, I cannot leave my ears uncovered. I and mean, this is seriously cold. And uh, so I put on the earmuffs that went on my helmet, which I normally left off, and now I can just hear my guide in the distance going, <laughs> can't really hear him very well. So I thought, well, that shouldn't be a big deal. I'll just, there's not a lot of people out here. I'll just follow that orange bib. Next thing I know, you know, boom, I run into my guide, which was my ex-wife. And that went over just like the topless beach. Uh, not really well. What I realized is I took those earmuffs off and I listened and the volume of her voice and the skis and everything came back into focus and I thought, aha, I'm using my ears for depth perception. Don't use my eyes because they aren't any good at it. Big, big difference. And these are, you know, these are part of the things of, of combining uh, the techniques. So we have to really think forward that when and if some of these technologies are developed and give people some vision, we have to be thinking about how do we deal with low vision, the psychological ramifications of not getting what, being able to read and drive. And this was a, an important part of why it worked for me and not for some of these other people who got depressed and committed suicide. My expectation was, this will be fun if it works and it's not a big deal if it doesn't work. That's a much different expectation than the ones that people had from their family members saying, oh, this is really important, it'll be great. Uh, maybe you'll get a job because you, you, you have vision, you'll be able to drive, you'll be able to see your kids for the first time. Uh, you know, all of these things were the, the kind of pressure that people unintendedly put on their loved ones around the idea of restored vision. When in fact, if you set the expectations lower and just think of it as another tool that is gonna 
be okay in some circumstances, not in others, then so be it. And you also realize the other aspects of life, such as ingenuity and tenacity, are really important. Whether you have sight or you don't have sight, but certainly if you're blind, it takes more ingenuity because you're constantly coming up with workarounds that a sighted person doesn't have to deal with. Crossing a street, you don't think about it. You, you look at the light or make your decisions and off we go. I won't say anything I only about crossing those streets with the red lights. Yeah. <clears throat> well, nobody's coming, you know. That's what they say in New York. <laughs> um, but I've, you know, I've found that um, with some ingenuity, I can enjoy crossing a street, but I needed those alternative tools and techniques. When you, you saw in the movie about the um, skiing at the Olympics, and there was a, a fun story on the way down there in terms of ingenuity, because I had a, a seeing eye dog at the time named Ricky, and he was this beautiful long-haired shepherd with red in his hair, and uh, this little kid in the store once said, Mommy, it's a giant fox. Uh, he looked kind of wild like a fox. And so after the Paralympics, before they, they had it integrated into the main Olympics, uh, we were skiing in Austria, and my guide and I said, hey, let's go to the Olympics, and uh, the, the amputees are going to ski a demonstration run. Let's see if we can ski one, too. Blind people weren't invited. So we went. We worked our, we worked our way into the, uh, into the venues. You know, showing up at the Olympics without accommodations or tickets takes some real challenging workarounds in and of itself. <laughs> but we did that in Sarajevo. Um, on the way down, um, we stopped in a hotel, and they'd never seen a seeing eye dog before. So marching into a hotel with a dog, you can imagine their reaction. Get out of here. And uh, they said, no way. And we, we'd driven my guide had driven all day, and, and we, we weren't going anywhere. We just said, we'll sit in the lobby, sleep on the couch. So we stayed there, and we talked to people coming in, and talked to them about the dog and about the Olympics and everything. And uh, I learned that the Olympics had a mascot of a wolf. And in uh, Croatian, a wolf is Vučka. So I got this brainstorm, and I went up to the counter, and I said, you do realize that this dog is the Olympic mascot. This is Vučka. <laughs> You know, with the language barrier and everything, you can pull something like that off. And they said, oh my gosh, you know, take the presidential suite. You know. <laughs> they brought steaks for my dog and everything. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, life is, I mean, it's fascinating when you're forced to come up with these workarounds that, you know, some poor sighted sod would just be sleeping in the, you know, the tiny little room. But we got the presidential suite. It, but it took a serious workaround to make that happen. Uh, gosh, lots more stories, but I want to leave some time for, um, for you guys to ask some questions. Uh, I'll tell one more skiing story because it, it really illustrates something that didn't work out. And that's when I, I decided to go speed skiing because I figured if you took the gates out of the equation, that's really the hassle for a blind person going around stuff. If you could just go straight and fast, then there's nothing in the way. I could ski competitively with a sighted person which I found to be true. And um, so we were invited. Oh, the insurance companies kept telling me, no, you can't ski in any of our races. <laughs> they were not thrilled with the idea of a blind guy skiing 75, 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and so uh, I, went, I was invited to this race in Aspen. And after training and being nervous the night before about entering into this race with the big boys, that are going well over 100 miles an hour and skiing a demonstration with them, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I don't really want to do this. <laughs> but we were out there, uh, nerves on edge, adrenaline pumping, and the president of Aspen came up to us and said, I'm sorry, guys, but we can't let you compete. We just got a fax from our insurance company saying if the blind person goes out of the starting gate, the insurance for Snowmass and Aspen are canceled. Well, he, he couldn't have that. Well, one of the people filming at that time was uh, Warren Miller, who's a famous ski filmmaker. And for Warren, this was no big deal. I mean, a blind guy skiing was nothing. He had you know, people on burning skis jumping out of gondolas. 
So he says, John, what if the blind guy doesn't go out of the starting gate, but he goes right below it? <laughs> and John said, he read the facts again. He says, out of the starting gate, so I think below it, it will be just fine. <laughs> you know, I'd had a momentary feeling of relief when they said I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I had to go ahead with it, so. I've always thought of that. Warren Miller is well into his 90s now, and he was really my mentor and, and, and set the example. We've been friends ever since because just when you start moaning about what your problem is, you know, you, you really should be focusing your time as soon as possible on those workarounds. So that's really what he taught me, and I try to bounce back and think of those things as quickly as I can. Um, Maybe I'll wrap up here, and then uh, we can have Jeff come back up, and we have some time for some questions. Um, I'll tell you that in the last, 2016 was a real challenge for me. Actually, the last several years, I, I, I got divorced, and of course, anybody knows how hard that is, but I got remarried. And these, are all, these challenges all fall into the same bucket. You've got to find the workarounds. You've got to bounce back, et cetera. A lot easier said than done. Um, last year, I had two bad things happen to me. And one was I got uh, throat cancer and had chemo and radiation and uh, went through hell for six months, came out of that, had a PET scan, I was completely clean. So that was exciting. Um, less, um, the more significant thing for the year was last January, my older son went missing skiing and was eventually found buried under an avalanche. And um, at the time, I was, you know, I said, Mike, if any time in your life you want to apply workarounds, now's the time when they're looking for them. There's 400 people out there, dogs, helicopters, and everything. And I have ra I'm surrounded by radios, and I'm calling up friends around the country, people in the military and the Air Force. Any connection that I had, I was trying to call in. How do we figure this out? How do we save my son? And we didn't, but I learned a lot in the process and decided it, going forward, this is going to be one of the things that I'm, my always away is going to be, I'm going to save somebody else's life. I'm going to change the way technology and laws are, are set up so that when there's somebody in an emergency situation lost, that we're not hung up by getting court orders to get the kind of technology that might have helped in my son's situation. And then more uh, excitingly, um, now I've got a real challenge at the Lighthouse for the Blind in Seattle. There is 70% unemployment among the blind, 70%. So those of us who have a job are really grateful for it. And the Lighthouse has nearly 500 employees, over half are blind or deaf blind. So imagine having both of those challenges, blind and deaf blind. And these, Men and women are working as machinists, and uh, it's a factory. It's a full functioning factory with injection molding machines and the whole deal. It's really amazing. <laughs> you interrupted my story. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about patience. <laughs> and so um, I'm really looking forward to creating more jobs and taking that to the next level and finding ways to make, make that happen in the Seattle community and beyond the lighthouses in, in several different states. And so I'm, I'm excited about that. Those are my future challenges. So um, I'll thank you officially, and then we'll take some questions. Thanks very much. Don't you love it? They just, they just forgive you. You know, that's, that's why everybody wants to be greeted when they come home by a dog. So we have about five minutes or so for any questions you have for Mike. Um, or Jeff. Or, or me. And the microphones are there in the back. Anybody up? If not, we'll stick around for a few minutes after if there's anybody too shy to speak to the microphone. Here comes somebody. Yep. <clears throat> Hi. Um, my name's Kirsten, and I'm part of the deaf community. I wear hearing aids. I'm hard of hearing. Um, and so I kind of related to you when you said that um, you, when you were talking about getting sight, people kind of see that as like, oh, you're not broken, or now you're saying that I'm broken. 
Um, so I'm curious, did you have any sort of backlash and do you see um, that maybe with your regaining of some site that you lost some sort of connection with the blind community or anything like that? Good, good question and I've had that question asked for me by people who either had or were thinking about having a cochlear implant because we face a lot of the same issues. Um, by and large, I did not have backlash, but I was really worried about it. And I was very careful with all of the media that I had to make sure that no matter what question they asked me, I gave them the same answers, just like any true politician would. <laughs> and so it was always, blindness is icing on the cake. It didn't change my life having vision. And a lot of people say, oh, come on. You know, I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate, having vision. But I said, no, no, there's, there's a lot of aspects about being blind, and it's not just going to the front of the line in Disneyland. <laughs> there's a lot of benefits to, to being blind and to the blind community that I wanted to embrace. And so that's why I still identify as blind, but I also don't want to ignore the great benefits in navigation and other things. The icing on the cake is, is nice as well as the cake itself. Anybody else? I think there might be one more. Yeah. Well, I've been curious about the device or machine that you have and how that works and how it relates to the company that you founded. Right. This is a Braille Note PK. It's actually a pretty old model, but I like small. <clears throat> Some of the newer technology with Braille is actually bigger and heavier. And for me, it's really great to just have notes and to be able to take notes <clears throat> quietly and efficiently and to be able to read Braille dynamically. Uh, so this device is essentially a computer with internet, email access, note taking capabilities, and of course GPS, which was the part that we invented. I, I didn't invent the Braille device, but uh, we did invent the, the GPS that ran on this device and now runs on iPhones and on PCs and under Windows and in a lot of different areas. So during the talk, were you using that to, uh, to refresh yourself and what sort of um, topics? Yeah, talking? and I was yeah. also uh, uh, tweeting people, you know, telling them. <laughs> 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 On that note, <laughs> um, we call it an evening. I think Mike and I will stick around for a little bit and answer individual questions. Thanks so much. But thanks for having us.